Okay, it's great to be together with all of you. The memory verse for this week, it was several verses from Psalm 145. Maybe uh, you can finish the last verse, though. That was part of the memory, Psalm 145.3. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness, yeah, finish the line. His greatness, no one can fathom. Oh, God, you are great. You are great beyond the beauty of our fall creation. You are great Beyond even the salvation we know in Christ, you are great beyond every work you've done in my personal life, right? The greatness of God. We can't fathom the depth of the greatness of God, Um, but it's an exciting night for us to be together. So we're going to do a little opening discussion here in our live class and in our Zoom. So I'm going to invite you just a few minutes. This won't be detailed at your tables Describe your present relationship with God. What are its strengths and its weaknesses? So we're going to just ask you, if you're willing, on Zoom, you can do that together at our live study here. Describe your present relationship. What's your relationship with God like today, tonight? What's it like? Describe the strengths and the weaknesses of your relationship with God. So we'll take about five minutes for that, and then we'll come back together, okay? Hi, Stu. Hi, Louia. We're we're answering the question. Describe your present relationship with God. Your strengths and your weaknesses. I can. Well, I, I would go ahead, ahead Lynn. Oh, <laughs> um, I can start just because he's he is he and I are really close. He has provided ministry to me every day, and. Um, I just know that if I have a need, all I have to do is speak it, and he provides it. Amen. He's just been taking care of me like you wouldn't believe. So, And my weaknesses is some days I, I have a hard time finding time to sit down and concentrate just on his word. And I can't even tell you what that means. I just know. (laughs) I don't know why. I mean, I have no idea what I'm doing. Just that that, I know that happens. And, and as I'm driving out, I would say for me, my strength has been more on going to him in my frustration, thinking that I can intelligently figure it out myself. Uh, I spend a lot of time in my head thinking, well, I can do this and I can do that, and then I would end up getting even more frustrated. So now I put it in him. I ask him to take it and try to get more him. I need to do that more often because that is a sense of my weakness as well. Because I still it's hard for me to turn that over and say, not mine, dear God, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Just let me know. And then I got to listen. <laughs> That's the hard part. <laughs> He's <Yep>. listening. <laughs> And then act. <laughs> yes, and then act. Yeah, act You're right. But sometimes that act is to not act. Yeah. <laughs> now shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I think my strengths in, in God were brought upon from the experiences I've had from being around the world. And um, I know from my first experience of reading the whole Testament. <laughs> And um, I was in the world of Lebanon. And even when I read the whole book, um, and I was in the midst of a war, I couldn't understand 
revelation and how that could be, how that could possibly be. Even though I've seen such evil in this, this part of the world, um, and all I could do is pray to God, you know, uh, I don't understand it. Yeah. I see it happening. But then as time went on and we got into the, the 90s, then it started to make sense. It started to be some light and we're listed in Revelation. And then I hear a little more about other folks such as Daniel and that. By seeing these things, it made my hair stand on end because these things are kind of light. It's like... I need to get stronger in the word of God. And that's what pushing me towards is, is seeing um, prophecies unfold right in front of me. Weaknesses are, I, I guess, is other people, influences other people, especially where I work. Bless you. You know, there, there's a lot of. Um, it's amazing how many people are. Uh, you, you try to give them the word of God, and, and yet some of them become defiant, so then they, they become offended. One minute, folks, we'll wrap up in one minute and come back together. I just kind of try to, you know, I just kind of walk away from it. I think maybe what I should do is find a better way, better, more words from the Bible, and, and, a, and a better way to approach it. <laughs> Instead of just kind of clamming up and walking away. That's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah, well, the Holy Spirit will follow them around and get that message through again and again and again. You know, don't feel defeated when that happens because he ain't going to stop. <laughs> Before you can grow, that's God's not him. Exactly. Exactly. It worked all Okay, if we can come together, I've got one more question. I'm going to ask the live study to respond uh, openly to this, and then I'll share some responses, of course, with the Zoom. Our second opening question. What does knowing God mean? What does it mean to know God? So our live study, we're going to ask for some responses here. Um, who's going to start us off? What does that mean to know God? Okay, God's with us all day long, every day. Great. How about another response? What does it mean to know God, Margaret? Margaret? To have a relationship with him where you can fully depend on him. Okay. Great. A relationship with God where you depend on him for every circumstance. Great. How about another response? What does it mean, Jeanette, to know God? It's like we have relationships here. Okay, great. And in order to build those, you have to get to know the person and spend time with them. And that's what it is with God. Excellent. Jeanette says we have human relationships, even right here in our Bible study. We have to spend time in getting to know one another. Um, and that's how it is with God, too. We spend time with him and we grow uh, in relationship with him. Anyone else yet? What does it mean to know God? John, go ahead. It's, and it's kind of like, not that I'm saying he's an insurance company, but it's kind of like <laughs> the insurance company, you're in all safe hands. Well, it's you're not fearful of anything, at least for me. I'm not fearful of anything or anyone or any circumstance because I'm in his hands. Excellent. How can I be afraid when I'm told not to fear? Excellent. So John says, relationship, knowing God means I have nothing to fear. I'm in his hands. He was using the analogy of the, uh, is that all state? You said, yeah. you know, you're in good hands with all states. So he was using that as an analogy what it means to know God. I'm in his hands and he's taking care of me. I've got nothing to fear in this life. So tonight our study um, is the no ability of God. The no ability of God. Can God be known? Can God be known? Now, of course, for most of us in this room, I believe uh, we've answered that question already. That's why we're actually here tonight. So 
Um, I tailored our study to bounce off of Grudem's uh, reading. It was nice and short this week, wasn't it? By the way, next week's reading is about 40 pages next week. So folks, don't wait. <laughs> hey, don't cut me off now, but don't wait too long either. It's, it, we're just studying creation next week. And the reading is 40 pages about. So, you know, split it up into little chunks. Just make sure you don't wait till next Tuesday night. Otherwise, how long is the memory verse? Holy, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the memory verse is pretty brief. <laughs> yeah, so that's really good. But tonight, the Bible doctrine we're studying is the knowability of God. Can God be known? So we're beginning part two of the Grudem text. Part two, we're beginning part two, the doctrine of God. We are reading only four of the 12 chapters that Grudem gives us on the doctrine of God. So if you look at the table of contents and then you look at your, your bookmark for the, you know, the chapters that we are reading specifically, we're only going to read four of the 12. So I'm going to merge some of the other things from the chapters that we're not going to be reading. So tonight we're going to briefly review three ways that we can know God. I'm going to ask our live study, maybe you can already think of those. In what ways has God revealed himself to us, live class? In what ways? Whoops. Okay, number one, creation. That's one significant way he's revealed himself so that we can know him. Number two, Through his words, specifically through the Bible, that's the second way God has revealed himself so that we can know him. And there's a third one that maybe is the the lesser one, and we'll talk about that. I'm thinking of the Holy Spirit because he revealed. Yes, and, and we'll connect the doctrine of the Holy Spirit to the doctrine of Scripture because even unbelievers can read Scripture, but they're not going to know God in the Holy Bible without the Holy Spirit revealing him. So we'll connect those two together. Is there any other way that God reveals himself to us? Barry? Through Jesus Christ. Through Christ, yes. Well, we're going to connect that as well, too, with the Holy Scripture and, and the Spirit. So this one, you know, we don't look at this much, and I'll start with that one first, but it's conscience. Conscience. The God reveals himself and scripture declares that God reveals himself through what we say is conscience. So we'll start with that. God's revelation of himself. So here we go. Let's ask a question of our live study. What can and can't an unbeliever know about God through conscience? What can and what can't an unbeliever know? know about God through conscience. Who wants to start us off? Live study. Jeanette? We can't know about salvation. God's plan for salvation. Okay, so an unbeliever through conscience will never know about the plan of salvation, which of course specifically includes the person of salvation, Jesus, right? Go ahead, uh, Pam. You can't know what God created. You can know that nature was created by him, the heavens. Okay, good. And will we'll, you've launched us into that, that second topic of God's revelation into creation. Um, so that's really important. Margaret and then John. Well, you can't know that there is a God. Okay, so... You can't know that he exists. Yes, our, our conscience... John, go ahead. We, uh, Margaret says we can know that God exists. So, John, you want to speak to conscience yet? What can... An unbeliever know about God through conscience. What what can't he know, John? He can know that there is a right or a wrong. Okay. Okay. There's the nail on the head, folks, that we really want to talk about when it comes to conscience. God has imprinted on every human being, every human being, a sense of right and wrong. This is part of the moral. Uh, image of God that is in everybody, including every unbeliever, every pagan person on earth has that sense of conscience. Now, is that conscience really operating really well in an unbeliever? The answer is no, of course not. Now, to to my own shame, is the conscience operating really, really well in, in believers? Not always, we say, right? Because I can dull my conscience just like an unbeliever and I can, I can disregard 
the Holy Spirit's voice to me who says, Robert, you know, do this and I decide to do that or go this way and I decide to go that way or, you know, speak this and I decide to speak that, you see. So even, you know, believers can mess with that moral imprint that God has put on everybody. And so the scripture even declares that conscience is one of those things for which mankind will be accountable for doing right and wrong. So anyone else, Faye, you wanted to, to speak about conscience, though? Uh, God, what he is doing, what he plans on doing, we do not know. Okay. His, so, what he, his will is. Correct. So that's helpful. Faye says, through conscience, we're not going to know the plan of God, what he is doing or what he's not doing. And that's absolutely correct. So, so the, the revelation of God through conscience, we say, is not very clear, especially because we are fallen humanity. So our sense of right and wrong in this world, you know, is pretty askew, right? Uh, and that tells you that the conscience, of course, uh, has been affected and it's affected by our fall into sin. So conscience will never tell you, of course, the correct thing to do in any and every given situation for an unbeliever, that is, you see, the conscience will never tell you that God is three in one. The conscience will never tell you about Christ. The conscience will never tell you about the gospel and the other things that you folks mentioned. So the Old Testament says Deuteronomy 139, I picked this one out. It's not in Grudem, you know, that the Old Testament uh, talked about um, the moral rightness and wrongness that we are to live by. Uh, and, of course, the, the written law, God gave the specifics for that. Now, if you turn in your Bibles, please, Romans 2, Romans chapter 2, I want you to see just select passages. Uh, and I, I'm sure Grudem mentioned Romans 2 somewhere in, in the reading tonight. I just can't confirm where. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Romans two, 1 and Romans 2 are key passages about the revelation of God to all of humanity. It's not that God has just revealed himself to those who believe on him. He's revealed himself, of course, to everybody in these significant ways. So if you're looking at Romans 2, I'm at verse 14. Found you, have you found your place? So there, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law. See, they're speaking of you know, uh, uh, Gentiles, non-Jewish folks who didn't have the moral law of the Old Testament. They didn't have the Ten Commandments, correct? So when they do things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Verse 15, since they show here, this is really important. Get your uh, underliners uh, or your highlighters ready. They show that the requirements of the law are written where? See, God has imprinted every human being with the requirements of a holy God. Is it a clear revelation of God? No. no, conscience is not a clear revelation, especially because of sin, because of our fallenness into sin. But notice verse 15 again. The requirements of what God says is holy and right and good are written on their hearts their conscience is doing what? What does the conscience do? It bears witness. You see, it's a voice. Conscience is a voice, and their thoughts are now what? Accusing, Accusing and then sometimes defending. Oh, that was the right thing for you to do, and the other person was wrong in that situation. You see, sometimes your conscience accuses you. Oh, no, that was the wrong attitude, Robert. That was the wrong thing to say right? Sometimes I get the proud defense of my conscience. Yeah, you were better than that person. <laughs> yeah, you're better. You're in the right. You're in the right. You see, so even our conscience is affected by the fall. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, we won't turn there. An Old Testament reference, God has set what in the hearts of men? Does anybody know that verse? Eternity. Barry, eternity. God has set eternity that mankind is going to live on after this life. He set that in the hearts of men. And Calvin, John Calvin, I thought it was interesting. He says, man, uh, unbelieving, unregenerate man acknowledges the inner imprint 
of God even in idolatry. Do you see Calvin's point? Even unbelieving men and women worship something besides themselves. That's the imprint of deity within us. We, we are the creation of the holy God. So even false worship is an indicator that there's this imprint in us of conscience, okay? So I found that really interesting. The New Testament talks about our conscience, Titus 1.15. Our consciences can be defiled, and we know that, 1 Timothy 4.2. Sometimes people who ignore their conscience repeatedly over and over and over and over and over again, what happens to the conscience? Does yeah, it, in fact, it, um, Paul uses an image of the conscience being seared, seared, as with a hot iron. You know, you got this hot iron you're going to brand a, a calf with, and it's in the fire all day long, and then it's like putting it on your conscience. If you ignore conscience long enough, it becomes seared and can no longer be effective at all. So, so the voice of conscience Leading people to God, it's like you're still going to scratch your head all day long, right? So we're thankful that uh, the Holy Spirit has given us this thing, but unredeemed mankind will never know God rightly through conscience. Never, right? Question for us. How well do you know God through your conscience? Now we're talking to the believing audience. How well do you here tonight know God through your conscience? Anybody want to respond? Okay, the Holy Spirit who speaks to me, right? And as I hear God's voice in my conscience and I obey what the Holy Spirit is leading me to do, of course, the conscience is activated and becomes effective, right? But if I, if I just like, no, 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 I don't want to do that, Holy Spirit. I don't want to do that, right? I don't want to call that person. I don't want to ask for forgiveness or repentance from that person. The more I ignore that voice of conscience of the Holy Spirit, of course, it becomes dull. And then when I really say, oh, God, what do I do in this situation? You see, then we get ourselves into a fix because if we've denied conscience and we've not been obedient to what God is leading us to do, that, then, I, then, then your hearing gets dull. You need a hearing aid. Uh, Mike's going to address that. I think our conscience becomes even more like stronger because as Christians. As Christians, it's conscience it's becomes stronger. in a society where it is a Christian values. Yep. You are now in I mean pagan societies they only have conscience, no right and wrong. Right. We have and you have then you're born into a society that's that's Christian or Jewish, and if you're you know, whatever, and you grow up and you have this the word of God to reveal the word of God to us, right. and it, it even makes the conscience more acute. Acute, yeah, I like that. More stronger, yeah, right and wrong. Just yes. you know that it says love the Lord your God with all your heart. And you know you're not. And yep. I mean, if you're a pagan, then you worship the false god. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But under Christianity, you, you're pressed harder, and it takes a lot more to sear. To your, yeah. Back to, not to reject your conscience, you're rejecting the written word that's known to the society. Excellent. Yeah. Mike is saying, of course, as Christians, having the written word of God, it affects our conscience in a greater way, right? Because the written word of God tells us right from wrong, and thus then Holy Spirit speaking to our conscience on it. So the two work, for believers, the two work hand in hand together. For an unbeliever, it's just worse. But for an unbeliever, it just gets worse. Yeah, yeah. Let's ask this next question before we move off of conscience. What do believers do to protect and to build up a clearer sounding conscience? What should I do? so that I, I can improve this imprint of God that we call conscience. What can I do, Barb? Okay. Sure, feeding on his word, and, and of course being responsive then to what God is saying, right? What can I do to make sure my conscience is protected and or built up? Anyone else? Uh, so, so Pam is saying, yeah, I've got to be reading the word because that's what is going to, you know, morally feed my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength, right? Great. Counsel and accountability. Counsel and accountability, right, is very, very important because Jeremiah says my heart is what? Deceptively wicked, 
my heart is so having counsel from other brothers and sisters and accountability, you know, what's going on in your life. Yeah, you know, those are important things. Anyone else yet on that? Barry? Jesus said, if any man will do my word, oh. he'll know it. Okay, here's the key thing, right? For conscience, obey God's word. And this really go, goes in line. Did did I get cut off already? It sounds, yeah. like, it sounds like something happened already. It's not flat. We had audio. Can, can these folks hear me yet? Can yes. anyone hear me yet? Okay, something happened. Maybe the batteries are going dead on something, but we'll work with it. Thanks. So um, Barry says, of course, obedience to conscience, obedience to what God says, do this, don't do that, is critical. I mean, uh, the more you deny your conscience, the more trouble you're going to get into, right, as a believer. So, um, uh, so that's an important thing. Now, let's go on to the second way that God has revealed himself. So we're, we're going, of course, from the lesser to the greater. Let's go to the second way. We're going to call creation general revelation, general revelation, creation itself. Anybody outside today? Yeah, I bet it's the batteries in this thing. So I'm going to try to change the batteries at the same time as I'm talking. And I'm not a good multitasker. So uh, let's see here. Hold on, folks. General. Oh, hey, that wasn't so bad. Um, Yeah. No, yeah, find the right thing, come prepared, hope that these two batteries work, you know, you just never know. So let's try this here. Is this what happened to John last week too? My goodness. My goodness. Okay, let's see if, let's see if that works. Oh, testing one, two. Can you hear me again? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Okay, some people are saying yes and That's good. So let's talk about general revelation, the second way that God makes himself known. How can we know God? Number one, through conscience. Number two, through creation. Did anybody walk outside today? Did you see some pretty colors this week? Mel went golfing, for goodness sakes. Yeah, so he had to see a lot of good things there, right? Here we go. Let's ask this question, the same one we did for conscience. What can and what can't an unbeliever know about God through creation. We're talking only unbelievers. God speaks through creation. What can an unbeliever know about God through creation? And what cannot, what can't an unbeliever know about God through creation? Okay, John says, through creation, unbelievers can know that a God exists. Go, do you want to go further on that then, John? What can't he know about God? who this God is and what purpose he was created. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Who is this God? Is he one God? Is he multiple gods? Is he like Zeus, you know, uh, you know, and, and the Marvel comics, you know, superhero kind of people. What, why did God create the world? Why did he create us? You're not going to know that from creation, right? Anyone else want to answer that question though? Uh, you see creation, but these people moving and we're not. Faye says there's just lots of questions that are unanswered. When I see creation, there's just lots of questions that never get answered. Okay, unbelievers that just aren't going to know what is going on here. <clears throat> so again, we're going to say you're not going to know about the Trinity from creation. You're not going to know three persons in one. You're not going to know the gospel, right? You're not going to know that. Excuse me. I didn't want to cough into the microphone. <clears throat> what are some other things you won't know from creation? Help. I don't think you can know, know God's love, his personal love, and his character. That's super important. Thanks for that. Let me see if I can get back connected here. So Jeanette says, yeah, you are not going to know God's personal love for you from creation. That's correct. You're not going to know the gospel. You won't know salvation. So Psalm 19 is one of those key classic passages. The heavens declare what? The glory of God and the sky proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Creation is a voice. It declares God. 
right? But we're not going to know a lot of things about God. So Acts chapter 14, verse 17. Let's go to that one. That's a new passage, I think, for us tonight. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 14, verse 17. Okay, did you find your place? That's a new one I think I picked out here regarding creation. So Acts 14, 17, Paul is saying, yet he, God, has not left himself without testimony. I like this verse. What has God shown through creation? He has shown kindness. So you can know from creation there is a benevolent or a kind God or gods, right, who has created this. He's shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. Here we are, right, you know, in the fall season of crops. And he provides you with plenty of food. Who who ate today? I did. Anybody on Zoom eat? Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at them. Look at them all waving. <laughs> and he fills your heart with joy. So notice these things. Paul says that's all part of the voice of creation. Declares God's kindness, God's provision, right? Crops in season. Wilma and Bruce look out their backyard and they see crops, you know, being harvested. Some of you live near farms as well, too. Then we turn to Romans 1, 19 to 20. If you do want to turn there, this was one of Grudem's uh, passages as well, too. Uh, Romans 1, 19 to 20. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain. So creation is a plain revelation of the kindness and the power of God. Uh, Romans 1, 20. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are what? All people will be before the judgment throne of God someday and and creation as the voice that God is a a providing God, that he's a benevolent God, that he's a powerful God, that everything happens by season. Um, Men are accountable for recognizing that, right? It still doesn't tell you about the gospel. It still doesn't tell you your sin. It still doesn't tell you Christ. But you're accountable for the voice of God in creation. Okay, that's an accountability. It says it's it's clearly there. Look at look at how the leaves turn colors and and the planets move in their orbits and the seasons come and go. And, you know, the moon waxes and wanes and, and those kinds of things. We go on and on about that. Right. But unredeemed mankind will never know God rightly through creation because of our fallenness. So a a person isolated from all Christianity, isolated from the Bible, isolated from radio, TV, you know, doesn't have a relative who shares Christ with them. That person is accountable for the voice of God in creation and conscience, even though both are dulled because of sin, right? Both are dulled. Our conscience we know, and of course, creation itself too. So let's talk about us though. How well... Do you know God through creation? Let's ask for some responses from our live class. So believers tonight, how well do you know God through creation? Through the growing of the leaves on the trees and flowers and... Okay, God is a giver of life, Barb says. So she looks at trees, plants, and flowers and sees, you know, life that's generated. Okay, and that's how she knows God. Margaret, go ahead. Okay. 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 We know God is a God of detail and and microscopic detail. Margaret says, right? Neurons and protons, and I don't know all those little amoeba things, right? But God's a God of incredible, uh, infinite uh, detail. And order. Pam, go ahead. Yes. How? Yes. Yes. Right. So Pam is saying 
in creation, I can know God's faithfulness because, yeah, the sun rises, the sun sets, right? The calendar moves, the days come and go. It declares God's faithfulness. So, George, how about you? Okay, and that brings us back to what Mike says. So, George says creation uh, reinforces, when I read Holy Scripture, I read the specific revelation of God, and I see that what it says is true out in my world. Right. That reinforces, of course, creation's voice. Yep. Uh, Mike and then Jeanette. How about the rainbow? How about the rainbow? <laughs> All right. I mean, we, we know about the rainbow. Yeah. What happened in Genesis. But yes. You know, for us as Christians, we see a, a promise from God that he will never do that again. Excellent. You know, we, but we understand it from a revelation. From the written word. Yeah. The rainbow. The unbelievers see that, but he's, I don't know. Sure, an unbeliever sees a rainbow and says, wow, that's really cool, right? It's really pretty. Uh, but for uh, And there's a scientific explanation for it. But for us, the meaning is double because of specific revelation. The rainbow means God will never destroy the earth again with a flood. Never. Not even a, you know, uh, hurricanes coming rapidly. And it'll even apply to them. Oh, I wonder if I they don't know that. Fact, that yeah. God will still not destroy them. Well, right. I was only right. Going that's, till Sunday that's a well, good word. Uh, Jeanette. I've got my procedure. All right. Well, no, okay. I'm going to go to next week and where I can stay longer. And creativity. <laughs> awesome. Unending beauty. So what? Excellent. He's an artist. Yep. God is an artist, Jeanette says, right? The beauty, uh, the detail, the colors, yeah. uh, the, the, yeah. the texture of creation. Yes. God's oh, an artist. Okay. Um, he's very creative. Well, and we don't see do him in that. Anyway. One more question. Oh. If I am part of God's creation, right? We all, we all agree. Every one of us tonight agrees. I am part of the creation. What is my responsibility to God? All right. That's too bad. Okay. Thank you. Honor, glorify God who made well, me, right? Thank him who made me, right? Yep. Yeah. And Barb said, be a good steward. Then, of, oh, you know, I'm part of creation. I want to be a steward of what he has made and created. Okay. I mean, I'm not running all the time. I just had a clue shot on yesterday. Yes. So I know that's not the one. Yeah. Seek God, right? Seek God. That's my responsibility as part of the created um, order yeah. to seek the well, one no, who made me, right? And to know his will and, then and to honor him in that, right? So, front, so like creation is, is the second voice, the second way for us to know very, God. Let's go to the third one, which of course is our favorite and, and the best one. This we call specific revelation, right? Specific revelation. You can know God. Right through sacred scripture, you can know God through conscience. Number one, you can know God through creation. Number two, you can know God specifically through the Bible. And thank God that He reveals Himself in the pages of scripture. Right? I mean, God communicated with human language, which was written down. We've covered, you know, the doctrine of the Bible already, so that I can know God and I can know him specifically. I don't have to scratch my head. Who is this benevolent God who does such beauty in the world? Who is this who sends rain that makes seeds grow and, and our fields be bountiful. Who is this? And what's my responsibility to him? This we call specific revelation. <laughs> now question, we're going to again ask what can what? and what can't an unbeliever know yeah, about be God cool, right? through the right. Bible? What can so what are they what doing with your kids? an unbeliever know about God through the Bible? This is oh, important oh, that we understand wrong. this question. Okay. We've asked it now three times. Oh, uh, I know another uh, symptoms. I do have fatigue. Okay, that's important. That's super important. The specific revelation of God still okay. will not make okay. sense to an unbeliever without the Holy Spirit. You must oh, have so you a saving relationship with Jesus to have the Holy Spirit so that when you read this, it's not just academia, oh, yeah. right? Anyone else? What can and what can't an unbeliever know about God from the Bible, John? He can know the simple message of salvation. Or whether he's a believer or not believer in scripture, that is clear enough for the unbeliever to sure. of it. Mm -hmm. What he can't know are the specific wills that God allows himself to share with himself of himself. Okay. Right. 
So an unbeliever can read and find the simple gospel message uh, of salvation in scripture, but what he can't find, again, John? Sure. So let me t- jump off of what John says. D- does, does that salvation apply to me? That's what an unbeliever will not no, know is, without the Holy Spirit. Now, I haven't heard anything. Does that salvation whether, apply to me? Does that sin problem apply to me? Does God have a will, John was saying, um, for I mean, my life that actually applies to me? They Paul won't know that. Jesus, Jesus, they Jesus can't Jesus know Jesus that. To get to the, because the, the only way out, that special just, revelation the Bible works is that the Holy Spirit makes it make sense. That's the phrase I've often used, right? The Holy Spirit. It opens your eyes, he opens your heart to know who God is. Otherwise, you're just reading McCall's magazine or Better Homes and Gardens. Right? Go ahead, Margaret. Yeah. You know, a non-believer should know when the Bible says. And I talked to Drew and he says that he's not just so fed up. We should just all get back to school and if people get so fed up, we just keep going. You know, understand. They have brain knowledge. Yeah. Because anybody that can read can... So you can know, you can, Margaret says, the unbeliever can know facts and details about God from the Bible, right? Just by reading it and studying it, right? Yeah. But they they can't know what does it mean for them mm-hmm. personally, the, the heart knowledge, the what do I do about what I know? Yeah. What do yeah. I do about it? You see? And that's what they can't know. Mm-hmm. So uh, God has left a testimony of himself. Everybody can find that out yeah, uh, in the Bible, that right? That God has left a testimony about don't himself. See, they don't but say they that can't know you. that God has authority over their lives and, and that the book is relevant for them. Yeah. It's relevant. And, and we, we are responsible to uh, obey what it says. Um, so the scriptures that were frequent, either in Grudem or some extras here, Romans 10, 14. Yeah. How then can they call on the one they oh, have yes, not believed know, in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? You see, so the, me- the specific we'll message of scripture must be proclaimed first. I mean, just to have a coffee table Bible, right? Does nobody any good, believer or unbeliever, right? A coffee table Bible, one that's dusty. You have to hear the words of God, but then that hearing has to be combined with faith to receive the blessing and the benefit of it. So Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is impossible to what? To please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he was, that he exists. Those you guys. must believe that God exists, that, that he is a real oh, being who wants to be known so and wants to have a relationship with you, even though he oh, is so not what, seen what and he's not that? audibly heard. You see? So oh, okay. he wants relationship, but you must believe that he exists. Yes, and, um, right? He's more than just uh, two dimensional ink on a, on a page. Right. Go ahead. I hope the weather kicks up, or at least where I does it isn't windy, where I can start the doing things and really getting heavy. It holds it down on a one true God. I mean, the general revelation has everything. Right, everything. Worship anything. General, general, general revelation, general. anything. General. Okay. Come back and it's it's just just revelation. I got to pull that. It's down to it's a lot and it's heavy. I don't mind doing yes. stuff Israel. Like it. And, and from that, we get the long or written word that this is the one true God. And yes. No other God besides No other God. Right. true revelation. So I'm going to go to Asian India in my head. There's no the many gods. Right. And the veil. And all the that receiver thing is real. Yes. From that special yes. so, Yes, yeah, so it's a special that way. And, 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 and all of a sudden, the whole damn thing comes out. The bracket falls right out. 
the wires that I rewire to pull out. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm yes. done. I am not ready. I am not doing this Excellent. Yeah. So uh, Mike was talking about God's specific revelation, of course, to Israel, revealing who he is and that he is the one true God. There is no other God. Right? So specific revelation is really, really important for us there. A couple of passages uh, to draw to your attention. First Corinthians 121. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. Good enough. You see? So, so, so even by cool. creation, you cannot you, know God personally God. just by creation. That was God's choice. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. You see? So the written word of God, right, the, has the power of God, the Holy Spirit using it to open blind eyes to see the reality of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that remember. come from the spirit well, of God, for they are foolishness to him, and yeah. he cannot wonder, understand them because God. they are spiritually Alexa, discerned. You need the Holy Spirit to, to help you understand. Thus, in the Old Testament, Psalm 14, oh, verse 1, the Bible calls the person without the spirit well, of God what? Right well, I'll think about this. That's a fool. The, that's not so I hard. I heard it to from somebody. Up. A fool. All the brackets are breaking. The Bible calls a person without the spirit of God a fool because they do not have the capability to comprehend and understand the existence of the one true God. So the fool says in his heart, "What? What does the fool say in his heart? There is no God." Yeah. See. So oh, you need the Holy Spirit, of course, and and we need to latch on to Christ by faith. Right? Uh-huh. To receive the Holy Spirit. No one says Jesus is the Lord except no, through the Holy Spirit. You see, so that's the chain reaction of how God has chosen to reveal himself and to, to make himself known so that we can live in relationship with him who is unseen and unheard. Right? And you're not being locked up in a, in a uh, mental ward uh, with your arms behind your back because you're schizophrenic. So we believe in the reality of God because he confirms himself to us as we believe Christ and as the Holy Spirit uh, speaks through the precious word of God to us. Okay. So what Bible disciplines will help me as a believer as we're closing this section to grow closer to God? What Bible disciplines help me as a believer to grow closer in my relationship to God? I hope this is an obvious one for every one of us, but go ahead, Barb, start us off. I was able to get two big corn stalks by the two front trees and I put pumpkins Around there, sure. put the lights finding the time to spend alone with God without distractions, right? It's his relationship. How how nice is it if Barb and Jeanette, and Jeanette are enjoying there lunch there. together, and mm-hmm. Jeanette gets on her cell phone and just starts yapping away? Yeah. Oh, good. That's why I could use you as the illustration. She doesn't have a cell phone. You see, relationship means time spent. See, for us as believers, we've we've got to encourage each other. It's time spent. With God. That's how relationship is built. Who else wants to answer that one, though? Okay, Mike says, you know what? Hey, be blessed. Open and read. Sit down, open and read. Yeah, that is. It is. It's the simplest of discipline, right? And, 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 and I hope that's where, you know, our conscience gets purified, where it's like, oh, yeah, I missed my Bible reading. I want to meet with you today, God. I want to meet with you. And your conscience says, oh, yeah. It reminds you once you got your hammer in your hand and you're starting to do all your yard work or something like that. It's like, get your Bible out, right? So the simplest of disciplines, time, the word, and God. There's how relationship is built, right? So now we're going to do two things that Grudem, you know, did really well. God can be known. The second part of our study tonight, God can be known. We're affirming what we all believe tonight. God can be known. Scripture testifies that you can know God. Scripture testifies you can know him, right? So John 17, I want everybody to look that one up. John 17, verse 3, it's important for us to highlight. So turn there in your Bibles if you would. 
We're going to look at the purpose of mankind. Why were we created? Why were we created? And I'm going to just jump to a New Testament verse for that particular answer. The purpose of mankind. This is exciting. Get ready. And then uh, watch uh, Craig and Ann do a, a backflip on Zoom. Okay. Yeah. Backflip. Here we go. Everybody there? John 17, sorry, verse 3. Nice. This is great. Got your highlighters ready? Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may what? That they may know you. Who's the you? God the Father, the only true God. Mike, when you're saying that, it's like you're quoting John 17, 3. There is only one true God. This is eternal life that they know you. See, Jesus is saying personal relationship with the living God is possible. The doctrine of knowing God. It is a real relationship that they might know you, the only true God, and secondly, that you know his son, Jesus Christ, whom you have said. Now, in the first century, relationship with Jesus, who had the best relationships with him in the first century? The apostles, right? Now, we're not going to get off on a tangent here tonight, but uh, one of the apostles begs the question, did he have a personal relationship with Jesus? One of the apostles begs the question, did he have a personal relationship with Jesus? The one who fell away. This, the, yeah, so start scratching your heads. He, he, see, this is where when we use the word relationship, right? Just, and then it gets a little sticky, but that's the tangent that we're not going to go on tonight. What about people and, uh, I mean, the who walked yeah, and with him and talked with him? And this is the same today. Yeah, what about people, about people in this church or other churches who walk now, with, they the say they walk with do, Jesus. They say they talk with city, Jesus, right? You get and, and, and we know Jesus says there will be some people at the great day of judgment to whom he will say, I never knew you. Well, we did I not have a relationship. Know. You thought true. you had I'm one, cool. but I it was care. not I'll a personal relationship with the living God. You were I doing Christianity. I'm you were doing some religion thing, correct? Yeah. Yeah. This is where now well, then anyway, you know, can't, the we've got to encourage each other to make sure we're not deceiving ourselves. We'll wait in line and camp overnight by Best Buy to get the deals for Thanksgiving. That's a yeah. That's an eight thirty question. So ah, it's a good one, Barbara. Yeah, she's right. asking about apostasy, uh, but yeah, we're just not going to go there. But let's let's stick with this verse. To to have that's eternal that's life that's is that's to that's know that's God that's the Father, that's to that's know that's Him. That's Jesus claims we can know God and him, the only true God and Jesus Christ who we have sent. So our existence, we exist here to know and glorify God. That's why we exist. That's why we're on this little planet, to know God, to be in a personal relationship with the God who created us. And we're in uh, existence to give him honor and glory, right? That my life is a living sacrifice to my mic. Okay, so I'm sitting in, because I had to go to Menards and get this thing for the Johnny fixed up. Tuned up my furnace uh, last week, Friday. And so um, my air conditioning panel, you probably should get that. The water yeah, panel, real just sense not for screen. The yes. Well, it was like, pet. just pouring. Right. Just, what not I told you? Yeah, we're not God's pet, he's saying. Oh, Johnny, I just want to call you. Right, right. I can write it down. So I used this pet to have on Sunday, up to point to Menards. And then I'm seeing him eating lunch, and I'm facing the road. If I'd like to watch the cars go by and stuff like that, okay, here comes a truck or squad cap, you know, seating in the back. Yes. So God in created us in a real relationship. Sue Colrich has a mic like on, and really we can't in hear you. Going forward. Oh, Remove in her. Seat. Okay, oh, so I don't, I don't, I don't know how to I took, people. Just I don't know that. It. It I can't reject anybody. Front, like a photograph. It Asking me to remove. Like it, his I don't, face was I don't know how to remove Sue. Sorry, going forward. You know, and, and uh, it, it what was, else you know, can I do oh, for I you? You have to give me instructions some other time on how to how to kick people out of Zoom. Uh, yeah, and it's like that didn't come with my credentials, you guys. What? What do you? What do you? Yeah. So I, I don't know. I tap on her picture, uh, Jim and and Debbie, but um, nothing on my screen allows me to do anything with individual people on Zoom. Sorry. 
So I'm going to keep going. They wrote a note and put put it up right to here so I can read their note. Sorry, gang. There's another glitch. I, 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 I told you. But can, so the rest of you can't hear me anymore? You can't hear me. He really did a lot of damage. So ask, put up a note and ask Sue to mute herself. Try it was that. Horrible. I mean, it was horrible. not paying I don't know what Debbie's is saying. I can't Let read the lips. Talk. Sorry. Let him fumble. So Let him I'll keep going, gang, and I, and I hope you can get something out of, out of it. I, I called her. Either that, you just have to call one of the but people in the live class, and maybe they can fix it. I called Sue, and I texted her. Okay. Yeah, I can't do it. Okay. Yeah, there's the problem with Zoom. Yeah, if you're talking to somebody that that's like see that's the relationship thing which is disconnected yeah so i can i can't remove people from the zoom unless i shut all of you off sorry so uh here i'll have to keep going just because of our time so god can be known personally uh, we exist to know him that's why we're created mike said we are not god's pets he created us specifically to have his image and be in relationship with him. I appreciate that. So God's existence is known how. We get to know the one true God through whom? Through Christ. This is where faith in Christ is critical because Jesus says, when you know me, then you know the Father. You see how that works? So Christ was sent to be the specific revelation of God. You could see him in the flesh. You could talk to him and you could touch him when you see me. So the unity of, of the Godhead. So Jesus' existence is known, of course, through the Bible because he's not walking and talking on earth today. We know Christ through the specific revelation of the Bible and faith in Christ alone right, is, is required for us to know Christ. To know Christ is to know that God the Father and we have relationship with him. So God can be known in a personal way. God can be known. What do we mean, though, by saying a personal relationship with God. What do we mean by that phrase? That I have a personal relationship with God. What do we mean by that, friends? That was a little... But she was all right. She had her own, and so I was surprised. Okay. Okay. Good it's not all right. Jeanette oh, says communication yeah. back and forth, right? He he speaks to me in his word, and I speak and to him in prayer and, and in worship and in praise and, and in adoration and in serving, um, right? So it, it, there's an engagement between two people, right? Relationship uh, calls up for engagement. So now name some people in the Bible who had personal relationships with God. I hope this is easy. Moses. Uh, his mother. When the weather gets bad, then they're closing up the window. Paul. So, so Abram, yes, in fact, is called what of be. God? Abram is called a friend of God, a friend. By the way, Jesus calls us friends too in uh, John chapter sixteen. Out of their house last night, and they drove to David, a man after son. This is personal relationship. Noah, I mean, a man who sits a hundred and fifty. Years. If God isn't real, do you think that guy would have hung out 150 years before the flood? You see, if there was no personal relationship, who else in the Bible had personal relationship with God? The apostles. Oh, we had the pumpkin. Enoch. Adam and Eve. Well, I'm sure. They walked with God in the garden, folks. I mean, this is what relationship is about. You walk, you talk. Moses okay, and uh, his and had uh, 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 and Abihu, his my carving, uh, my pumpkin. His, so were those, those were his sons, nice were they? Wasn't, um, and Aaron no, and the 70 elders of Israel, they, they saw party, God, they ate and drank here. with him. Yeah, lucky Gary right? was there. They I did common involved, relationship things with God. Already. Now, Bear in mind, we are saying the form of God they never saw. The Bible says the form of God because the New Testament declares God himself is what? Spirit. So he does not have a physical composition to him. The form of him, the, the Old Testament says they never saw the form of God. But I really appreciate part of Psalm 139, 1-5. I'll just remind you of this. 
you know, for time. It could have been uh, one by there, nine. David is declaring, you, you know me. The break time. Psalm one 135, gets up 135. And you <laughs> know me when I sit so, um, that was and when I anyway, rise, and, uh, you perceive my uh, oh, Bob, thoughts even from so far so distance, right? You know my going one, out. Yeah. And you're familiar with all my ways. So you see, all these terms are the terms of relationship. See, relationship. You know all my ways, right? The, the, yes, this declares the omniscience of God. But here, these verses really show relationship, right? And you know a word that will be on my tongue before it's on my tongue. Yeah. Um, right? That's relationship. Nice These are all terms and phrases of relationship. Who is your friend? So uh, her, Jesus took three uh, disciples up uh, on the mountain and for special uh, ministry purposes. So like friends with Peter, buddy, James, and John. So, right? So relationship nice even uh, from the 12 down to three. Um, right? John 15, 15. Um, I have called you on my Bible friends for everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. And you've got it written down. John 15, uh, 15, right? First Corinthians three, God's spirit lives where? God's spirit. Oh, right now, yeah. That's relationship, you see? That he dwells and lives, right? First Corinthians 10, 16. This is one yeah. we don't often use well, for the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. But there Paul says that the and believer and uh, Jesus have a particular relationship so here. And the term I have, I've used like said, is the I term participation. Morning, we participate time, in the body and the blood of Jesus in the Lord's Supper. This is relationship terms. Okay. And but, yeah, it's Corinthians also one three, the father of compassion and the God of all you see, that's relationship. He's probably wondering why he, he cares for your condition. He cares for your emotion. So he comes with compassion and comfort because that's part of relationship, right? When you're discouraged or when you're down or when you've lost a loved one, here God comes in relationship. Galatians 2.20, Sue so why is here tonight? It's her it's favorite the verse. Address, I Christ lives where? Thing, Just so like the Holy Spirit lives in, in me. Christ lives in me. For any meeting, join That's any meeting. That's relationship term. Right? Um, you need and Revelation 21, number. verse 4, my last one. You know, the Bible is just filled with the language huh? of relationship. Hello? When when I get to glory, this is one of those surprising verses, right? Yeah. What will well, God do when I first see and meet him and encounter him? What will God do? To me. So on him, I said Revelation Monday, I have my four. bladder Anybody? thing, so I got to drive the entourage. That's it. God hurts so, per so personally, meets me in glory. In glory. He wipes they were on tears from my over. eyes. I guess we can get back to That's relationship. Things. That is close. So. And intimate and personal, and right? Sam. All of Scripture so agrees that, right? Now, there are analogies of personal relationship. Have, so I'll do this just I'll very find quickly. Out You'll get well these for the most part, right? Yeah, there are many analogies to, the, to the relationship the between a believer and God out that out. I know God personally. The analogy no, is, number no. one, a um, son who knows his father. A son who knows his father. That's a relationship term. Me. And God and called either. Israel his firstborn son. His firstborn son. Israel has a relationship. A um, number two, the analogy so. of a wife who knows her husband or no. a bride no. who knows her Bridegroom, you see, those are relationship analogies all over the Old and New Testament. Hosea chapter 2, I will betroth I you to me forever, stuff. God says. I will wow. betroth. That's a relationship. Yeah. He marries you, <laughs> you see. Num number, uh, sure. in, in yeah, the New right. Testament, stuff husbands, is... love your wives as, oh, God. as Christ so loved the church. You, you, do you see? Relationship terms. Number three, a subject who knows his king, right? A king yeah. and his subject. So that analogy is all over scripture. Number four, a sheep who yeah, knows know its shepherd, right? Psalm 23, verse one well, says, 30,000 kids. The Lord is, is my shepherd. My shepherd. 
my shepherd. Oh, yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. The relationship, sheep and shepherd, right? Yeah, but then Psalm 100, awful. verse 3, we are his people, yeah, I mean, the sheep of his flock or pastor. John 10, I don't know what, two companies? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And listen carefully. My sheep know me. They know my voice. And they follow me. You see the relationship relationship so, term oh there, that's gosh, powerful, I mean, John chapter know, 10, the sheep and shepherd one. Right? Out and let everybody get out and get through it. Like I said, we keep dancing with uh, Song of Solomon, you know what? You're making me go back. Does Song of Solomon show relationship uh, with God? I think by analogy it does. I personally prefer now, after I studied it you know, about four or five times after, after uh, Lutheranism, that it truly is the Old yeah. Testament's marriage. So now it really is. God here? showed how dating and courtship right. and marriage should work, Song of Solomon. Oh. But by application, Song of Solomon showing that, that love of God, you know, for his for his bride. No, but but I think no, it, it really is meant to be the Old Testament marriage manual. So uh, specifically, and that. it's excellent oh. book to study at oh. any time. Oh. So uh, sheep and shepherd, and lastly, disciple and teacher, right? The relationship of disciple and teacher. So uh, just a quick question. Which analogy best describes your relationship with God? Which analogy? Sheep and shepherd, I heard. How about in the back, John, maybe? No. So in, the father and son you know, in relationship. Paul, yeah. Anybody Paul, else? Do you relate to one Paul, of those analogies uh, more than? Paul, okay. okay. That God is your husband, right? That the bride and the bridegroom pictures, and of course, so many parables deal with that. Aren't those powerful? That's relationship. Yes. It's all knowing God. Yeah, I can know God, the true. living God. Are you right? guys sleeping together? So or uh, no? that's super, 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 duper powerful. Now, um, oh. just one passage oh, for see. special okay. reflection. Okay. Uh, Philippians three ten. Are you sleeping? Everybody, turn thing? to Philippians three, oh. verse ten. Just one oh. passage for special reflection on knowing God. This one caught my attention. Yeah, no, it was I mean, in Grudem, you know, so it was there, but I want you to look at it uh, personally with me, too, as, as uh, uh, we finish this part, then. Uh, we I can know. know God personally, right? Mm-hmm. Philippians 3.10. By the way, where if you found your place, where is Paul when he's writing well, I had my to the for, Philippian uh, believers? Where for, uh, is he? And I went... He's in jail. Appointment to this place. He's in jail, right? And so, uh, is this his first imprisonment day, or his second? I, I forget. I yeah, maybe a second. Up, John so says maybe the know. second. I forget. I'll I'll yeah. have to lean on you for that. He's in prison, uh, but look at what he says in the opening uh, part of verse uh, ten. Um, I think. What does he say? Uh, Oh, yes, for sure. I want to know him. About you all the time. He's in jail. Well, My he, question is, even didn't, if you, made, possible, didn't you meet you him on the Damascus Road? Not didn't he initiate a relationship with you, right, through Anna and, 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 and the, the whole break out conversion experience? Why is Paul tired. saying what he's saying in Philippians 3.10? I want to know. Didn't he know him? Do you still eat or do you have a loss of appetite with it, with the lack of Brothers and sisters. And that's why he used the word no. Yeah, John says, even in prison, nearing yes, yes. the end of his life, if we're even you know within a year or a couple of years, you know, based on which imprisonment this was, Paul yeah. still has this hunger and the desire. To know a funny thing. God, the people better. who have that as a permanent don't disability. you, brothers like and Carol. sisters? Carol and Jake, that's a mark, no by the way, of the genuineness. Listen carefully of your relationship so with the living I God, who you can't see and who you can't audibly hear. The mark of the I hunger of God. Chocolate. I want to know you more. <laughs> I want to know you better. I, I hunger and okay, thirst for the living I'll God. Where can I go to be class. with the living God? You see, the psalmist it's often did that. So yeah. this is a mark. Here Paul is. He's at the, the end of his life. And, He's okay, established I'll churches all over the, 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 the Roman world. He is proclaimed Christ. He's preached you. Christ, right? Oh, and and okay. God used him to raise him. And he still says, I want to know him. 
about judges. It sounds like the first yes, thing know, of a convert, but his long past conversion isn't. He says, God, I want to know you more. Okay. That's a mark that your relationship with God okay, is genuine. Okay. Because, because in this yeah, life, we are so finite like and God is infinite and, and we can feeling, never get enough of him. We never can. Never can. She, she okay. pushed him back and cleaned so around. now we go, of course, so to the last that part so that uh, Grudem uh, dealt with. And that's... Wow. Uh, and that issue. really God was a cute be toy. Fully it known. actually works and actually does... We know. can know God. It's okay. We can truly know God. We can really oh, know God. God. We can be in a relationship with him. But he cannot be... Okay, fully touch, known okay, by us pro calling. primarily yeah, because you. of two things. Okay. Number one, Careful, be safe. Okay. I, I, I'm a sinner Bye. and he's not. And number two, I'm finite and he's infinite. So we will never fully know everything about God that can be known, even through your best teachers and preachers. <laughs> Even through your best devotional time memorizing scripture, even through your conscience, you're doing everything God says to do, not do what God says don't do. You know, creation, you're worshiping God in it. You're seeing his provision. There is still more of God. And Paul says, boy, I want to know more of God. Mike, go ahead. I think in the resurrection, we're, we're told we're going to spend eternity with him. Yeah. A lot of people have false ideas of what's harvest and everything. Okay. <laughs> For all of us, we, we know, I believe it'll be we'll know God and it'll be an eternal revelation of himself to us. Yes. It'll never stop because he's unending. Mike so says the revelation will yeah. be in relationship with a God will reveal himself and we'll know things about God and it'll and it'll be an eternal revelation of God and it will never stop. Yeah, so I love that. He, he doesn't not There's no limit. Yeah. Never come to an end of him. So He's Mike says, yeah. you will experience an eternal revelation of more of God for all eternity. And this this is then the question that Grudem asks in his text. It's like, aren't you going to get bored in heaven? It's all, it's all the same all the time. It's just glorious floating on a cloud. And he says, no, no, no. Mike says, no. Because even in eternity, you will never fully comprehend all that there is of the uh, omniscient, omnipresent, powerful God. That he will reveal progressively, I think we use the term, of himself more and more incrementally, even in all eternity. So that's the glory of this life. We explore God more and more. We grow closer more and more. And in all eternity, he keeps revealing more and more. And that's a praise, you know, that, that we have. So scripture testifies then that there is an incomprehensibility to God. We cannot fully comprehend all of God in any of his individual attributes. So we might really know the love of God really well. We might really know the judgment of God really well, but we don't know the full extent of those attributes. Does that make sense to everybody? I think Grudem did a nice job in, in, in talking about that. Humans are limited to time and space and we are subject to Adam's corruption. So um, I, I, th that's the glory of God coming to meet me and saying, hey, I want to be in a relationship with you because I want to share with you who I am uh, and, and my glory. So that's where the scriptures talk about we cannot see the fullness of God. In the Old Testament, nobody could see God and live. Uh, the Lord spoke to Israel out of the fire, but they could not see the form of God. Uh, there are secret things to God. There's mystery to God. Does, does anybody acknowledge there's mystery to God that you're just not figuring out in this life? Anybody? Right? There's something, you know, the will of God the purposes of God, we engage in those things, but there are some things we just don't figure out. Job 11, verse 7, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? Oh, sad. God doesn't have any limits. There's nothing that limits God. Can you go to that infinite part of God? And this is where we end up just worshiping him because he is infinitely magnificent beyond my comprehension, right? Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness, no one can fathom, right? We talked about then that God cannot be fully 
fully known, right? He lives in unapproachable light. So here's our bottom line, because I'm trying to wrap up. Knowing God versus knowing about God. How do I know if I know the personal being of God versus I have information about him? How do I know that I have the personal being of God in relationship versus I just have head knowledge about him? Who will help us with that? How can Because this is the bottom line, folks. If we walk out of here someday and we don't have a true relationship with the living God, we might be one of those Matthew 7 people. And the Lord says, depart from me. I never knew you. Right? Yep. So this is the bottom line. So who can help us out? How can I know that my knowledge of God is a personal relationship versus information? Okay. So Mike says, it's really important that the fruits of my life, you know, which starts again with conscience. Are you actually listening to, you know, your conscience and doing as God directs, you know, make sure of course it is God directing it, but by the fruits of my life, do I worship God? Have I given myself fully to God who made me to know him? Do I enjoy him? Do I enjoy him on Sunday morning, 1030, when it's going to be 35 degrees outside, nails preaching to a frozen microphone? Do I enjoy God? Do I love, do I want more and more time with him, right? Who else will answer that question? How do I know that my relationship with God, my knowing God is a general relationship versus uh, information? Pam, go ahead. <clears throat> Yeah. Yep. yep. But um, conviction, and then there's a difference between conviction from the Lord and guilt, because of, sure. of, of you know that an unbeliever might have the guilty for something. But you can feel when the Lord convicts you, you can feel the grieving of the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to say it's emotional, but it's a it's a conviction. That you, Okay, so uh, Pam was going to the area of conviction um, that th there is that true communication between God, uh, especially in, in conviction of, of doing something righteous, but also perhaps conviction if if I'm not doing something right. Where else would that come from except God is is operating in my personal individual experience, which is incredible, isn't it? Okay, so 1 Corinthians 8, verse 3, I leave you this verse. This one was precious for me years ago when I was searching that out. It's like, Robert, do you have just a head knowledge of God or do you have a relationship with God? 1 Corinthians 8, verse 3, the man who loves God is known by God. Otherwise, you wouldn't love him. You wouldn't love him. So, Mike, the fruits... You know, of that, 1 Corinthians 8, 3. I thought that was precious, right? 1 John 2, uh, 5 and 6. This is how we know we are in him, right? This is how we know that we are in him, in a relationship with him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. So, Mike, we're right back to where you were, right? Walk as Jesus walked. So, those two verses... Please, may they be a confirmation of the truthfulness of your relationship with the living God or a confirmation that perhaps you just got good head knowledge and, and maybe need to begin uh, a new relationship. So here's, um, do you all know J.I. Packer? J.I. Packer, he just died this year. Uh -huh. Knowing God is his classic book. This is 50 years old. Uh, and uh, here's a, a brief part of um, his writing. I think you'll enjoy this, knowing God. Everybody ready? What supremely matters, therefore, is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that he no. knows me. That's right. I am graven on the palms of his hand. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend 
one who loves me, and there is no moment when his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me, and no moment, therefore, when his care falters. This is momentous knowledge. There is unspeakable comfort, the sort of comfort that energizes in knowing that God is constantly taking knowledge of me in love and watching over me for my good. There is tremendous relief in knowing that his love to me is utterly realistic, based at every point on prior knowledge of the worst about me, so that no discovery now can disillusion him about me in the way I am so often disillusioned about myself and quench his determination to bless me. There is certainly great cause for humility in the thought that he sees all the twisted things about me (coughs) that my fellow men do not see, and I'm glad, and that he sees more corruption in me than that which I see in myself, which in all conscience is enough. There is, however, equally great incentive to worship and love God in the thought that for some unfathomable reason, he wants me as his friend and desires to be my friend and has given his son to die for me in order to realize this purpose. We cannot work these thoughts out here, but merely to mention them is enough to show how much it means to know, not merely that we know God, but that he knows us. Is that a good paragraph? Okay. Yeah, I thought that was particularly uh, a blessed thing. So let's see what our Zoomer sent perhaps for a question tonight. Do we see any Questions? Did anybody send questions? There's lots of chatting going on here. Is there any questions from Zoomers? How how do you scroll through this? I don't even know. You guys chatted a lot there. Oh wait. Look at oh my goodness. Look at our head. That'll take me two weeks to read through all your chatting. Uh, do I see? Uh, Where'd she go? Did you get Sue taken care of? They're, they were chatting back and forth on trying to help Sue. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see anything specific from our Zoomers tonight, um, but we're, we're pretty close to nearing the end. And uh, we, we actually would have time, if, if you care, turn to Pate in Grudem. Let's turn to his discussion questions, because those were, I think, really helpful. And I'll actually get him in tonight. I'm on page 152 and 153. Let's check and make sure your manual has has those two. Do you find questions for personal application? Uh, 152 and 153. Um, If your text is a little bit different, somebody says it might be one page off, 153, 154. Um, Some of the newer printings, right? So, um, uh, number one, we've already covered, right? And heaven, some people think heaven sounds boring, but yeah, Mike t- talked about God's revelation being ongoing, even in perfection, right? By the way, Adam and Eve, that, that's the testimony there. They didn't know everything about God. That's why they walked and talked with God in the garden. And they were in, in perfection right before sin. Number two, questions for personal application. How can we be sure that when we reach heaven, God will not tell us that most of what we had learned about him was wrong and that we would have to forget what he had learned and begin to learn different things about him. I think that was useful. How about our friends here at the live study? Can you answer number two for us? Well, then he wouldn't be God because there would be inconsistency in buying and receiving. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, this this the revelation of God is the true revelation of God, but it also is the truth of his word. Otherwise, God yeah, would be known as a liar if he gave us wrong information about him. Now, uh, don't forget, human uh, teachers and preachers can be subject to error. And that's why, aren't you glad the Holy Spirit lives where? And he actually is the teacher, correct? Not, not the human teacher or preacher. 
The Holy Spirit teaches. So this is why we, we're grateful to have the extra witness of God in conscience, because as you discern what you're hearing, does it match what the Bible says, right? Is, is what the human teacher and preacher, the radio preacher, your, your favorite TV preacher, you, you discern by the Holy Spirit, is this exactly what God has said? So that's really important, okay? Um, number three, do you want to go on knowing God more and more deeply for all eternity? Why or why not? Anybody care to chew on that one? Jeanette, thanks. Was it, was it in the book, um, Randy Alcourt, the Heaven book that explained when we were in heaven, we would be just in awe of him constantly saying, holy, holy, <laughs> because we would keep, keep on learning more and seeing his greatness and his beauty more and more. Right. It's like it fills your soul. It's, it's new every day. It's not boring. It's exciting. Great. Yeah, going on, you know, knowing God more and more is exciting. It creates it creates a thirst to know more. That's the interesting thing about knowing God. It creates a thirst to know more. So for all eternity uh, to be able to do that, you know, will be really exciting. Okay. Well, friends, uh, let's go. I'm actually going to get the hymn in for tonight. And uh, they suggested an alternate hymn. I think more of us know uh, better than the one that's printed in there. Uh, I didn't even know that one. So if you would turn to page 210, page 210, and let's see if, you know, 211 uh, might be for some of you. The hymn, uh, Oh, Worship the King, is one that I think is more familiar to us. So this is what we'll close with, and then I'll close with a word of prayer. Now, so that I don't blast everybody, I'm turning off my microphone so that as I lead the hymn, I'm not blasting the ears of the Zoomers, okay? So you, I don't, you may not hear me, but this is our worship hymn to close for tonight. I hope you can jo join along with us as well, too. And I suggest there's uh, six stanzas. I'm, I'm going to lead us in number one, four, and six. So I'm on page 210, Oh, Worship the King. And we're going to sing one, four, and six, okay? This one, oh, really? So, somebody put it on their cell phone, the music? Uh, maybe somebody could do that, but um, here's how one goes. Join in, and then maybe in, in verse four, you'll join as well, too, right? Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing his power and his love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Let's go to number four. Your bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. And number six. O oh, measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to him you above. The humbler creation, though feeble their ways, with true adoration shall list to your praise. Amen. <laughs> Father, thank you for relationship with you. We've celebrated you tonight, Lord. We've searched your scriptures that we might know you better. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, oh God, that you took the initiative to come down and meet with uh, the people you've created and giving us the revelation of yourself that we can trust in sacred scripture. God, we do hunger and desire to know more of you, even as Paul sat in jail and, and prayed out those words to know more of Christ. God, that's our desire. That's our hunger tonight. 
So please keep feeding us incrementally. You know the right time, the right places to teach us and to feed us. But God, help us to hear your voice clearly in your precious word. Forgive our sin. Remove anything that's an offense to you. Speak to our minds and our hearts, God. If there's something you want us to do, speak to us that we might do it. We might be humble to you. God, but please guard us from being deceived by other voices or even by our our, our own heart that sometimes tells us the wrong things. God, thank you for the precious word that we can trust. And as we go from here tonight, we pray for your blessing. Grant us safety as we drive home. May we glorify you, the God who has come to know us. And now may we walk with you as we know you. And we look forward to the day we'll see you face to face. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Bye, guys. Good night. Good night. Um, Good night. Yeah.